over to this computer. Now we're going to share a screen. Okay. Now we should be recording. And then in the unit, you'll see this post as a Zoom uh, lecture. So you can go back and get it. So start the PowerPoint. I know you are excited to be here on a Friday, right? Okay. Yeah, that was a big yes and a big clap. First week of school you here on a Friday morning. But everybody screw after this, right? Today, the week's done, weekend starts at 10 o'clock. All right, good deal. So leukocytes, this innate immune system, and that's where we're, we're, we're moving into that later in the lecture, in lecture two. These leukocytes found in the peripheral blood, okay, so that means they're in the circulatory blood, and they play a key role, both innate and adaptive immunity. You'll see that in our next lecture too. So you're just now getting into hematology. You had that this morning, right? Did you ever hear of a neutrophil? You have gotten there yet? Or are you not in white blood cells yet? We talked about it. Talked about it, all right, good. Eosinophils, basophils, they all kind of look pretty close. They stain a little different. Some are, and neutrophils are your main guy. You'll see him more than anybody else in the diff. Monocytes and lymphocytes, they're the non-segmented neutrophil, I mean the non-segmented white blood cells, and they play a big role too. So here's some pictures. Okay, so we get our neutrophil to the left. Got two of them. Okay, so when you do your right stain, you'll see these are red blood cells, these are white blood cells, those are neutrophils, and we got a little platelet down here. And then the eosinophil picks up the red, granule stain red, right there in the middle. The eosinophils have a role, and we're going to go through their roles. Monocytes to the left. See the different staining. And that basophil is a little disappointing, but it does pick up. But usually they're a lot darker, same purple. Uh, the granules pick up just heavy, heavy. Uh, but you got your monocytes here. And you see they're just the biggest. And they have a different little staining of their cytoplasm that helps you determine them from limps. But if that monocyte moves into the tissue, right? We know these things can leave the circulatory system. I don't know if you knew that or not, but they can leave it and go out into the tissue and that's where they do their best work, okay? So what is a macrophage? Let's start there. Is there a difference between a monocyte and a macrophage? Let's see where you are. All right, got a big, big definition today. Monocytes are called monocytes when they're circulating. When they leave the bloodstream and get into the tissue, they become known as macrophages. Okay, so it's the same cell. Okay, it's just where it's located. So you'll get that gene, don't worry, you're going to get that reviewed again. Macrophages play a role in initiating, regulating the innate and adaptive immune responses. The innate immune function is this is what goes on, okay, without any help, right? We know we're born with these cells, they circulate in our bodies, they didn't have to be stimulated in any way, but kill microbes, okay? They just eat, eat, eat anti-tumor activity. We don't know how much this goes on every day in our, in our bodies, all right? We're hoping it's going great. Like when we, you know, and I, I used to run a whole lot. I know I don't look like it anymore, but I used to run a lot and I always would run down the road and here come this truck and it'd be early in the morning and it would just be this smoke coming out of the truck and I knew I was gonna what, take a big breath full of exhaust from a car, right? We know that's not good. But if I inhaled that exhaust and it got to my lungs, I would hope there would be some kind of immune response or a cell that would love to eat that exhaust, all right, and not let it linger in my lungs and let it do any harm. Okay, so we don't know how much is going on with these cells when we have issues, when they recognize something that's abnormal and the cancer cell would be abnormal, right? And we would hope our immune system would recognize that, and we know it does. We 
know it takes care of a lot of questionable looking cells that if they don't get a chance to survive, do their business, then maybe we don't have cancer, right? So we rely on our immune system, I think, to prevent a lot of different issues that go on with, with tumors. Parasites, when we get a parasite, our immune system knows that's not supposed to be here and it likes to eradicate that. And we have one of those white cells that we saw earlier that likes to increase when we have parasites. Phagocytosis, how much do they eat? What are they eating? Hopefully they're doing great. And then secretion of the cell mediators. This is those cytokines that we said, hey, we, we kind of left that out last year's class. But these are the signals that are released into our bodies that communicate. Okay, so there's this, whether it's just some kind of attractant, like, hey, I'm going to let out this cytokine and that's going to bring you to the area, that's great. But it might be other signals that do different things to the cells and bind to the other cells. And then the process of the immune system keeps going. And that would be the adaptive part. Okay, so there's a lot of innate and a lot of adaptive that the macrophage plays a role in. Mass cells. You may or may not have heard of mast cells. They resemble the basophil because they pick up all that uh, primary stain and the right stain and they don't let go of it. Okay, so but they come from a different lineage and they play a role in allergic reaction. So these are these cells that are present. They also can function as antigen presenting cells and they can enhance or suppress the adaptive immune response. So, these are the cells we're playing with now. So we've moved on from macrophages to mast cells. Okay, just a name that you need to be familiar with, kind of understand that these, we're gonna talk about these cells in different parts of the body. But allergic reaction would definitely be a key to the mast cell. Dendritic, those that have had AMP, which is all of you, when you hear dendritic, you think what? Dendrites, oh, this must be some kind of nerve ganglion cell that just kind of hangs around the dendrites and then the cell body and the axons and not really, okay. That's, it's just not, don't be confused by that. Hope I didn't confuse you by bringing you that to light. But they're covered with long membranous extensions like the dendrites, right? And the cell body has that, you know, wild look to it. And those are the dendrites that take in the signal to the cell body and then release it out to the axon. But it's just because they resemble the dendrite that they get their name. They're considered the most effective antigen presenting cell in the body and the most potent phagocytic cell. Okay, we like them. We like them. All right, so these cells are going to be, if I'm the best phagocytic cell, then I'm going to hang out where your body needs me the most. So where is your body going to be taking in antigens, all right? Right, where are they going to be? It might be in the skin, it might be in the lungs, they might be in any opening you may have, right? They're going to kind of hang around those areas. They're going to be strategically placed. So we always say the immune system is like this going to battle, going to war. We're getting all of our soldiers and our players, and we got all these different ways to prevent and fight off infection, right? So I don't know. I mean, I you know if you can make that analogy now or not, but it's pretty good. I mean, that's the way I look at it. Like your body's in, at war every day. You don't know what you're going to be exposed to. You don't know who's going to be coughing all week and then tell you, hey, I don't. I went to the doctor and I don't know what my result might be this week. Correct. That's kind of the day we're in today, right? We just don't know, right? But we're hoping that it is a non, a, you know, asymptomatic, no big deal, and we get through this, and every week that we get past is a better week to the next, and we start to see what we hope, which is this, but we may not, may not see that yet until we get a vaccine to get the people that hadn't been exposed to it taken care of. Lymphocytes. Lymphocytes, you see one right here. It's not a very good slide, but there it is. Okay, they look just a little bit bigger than a red cell, but they've got a purple nucleus. They got very little cytoplasm, unlike the monocyte. 
about 20 to 40 percent. So between neutrophils and lymphocytes, you pretty much got your diff covered. Okay, when you're counting diffs in hematology, you're going to count neutrophils and lymphocytes. You might click over for a monocyte every once in a while, and you may see an eosinophil every once in a while. Okay, but these are your main two players. We have B and T, and we can't tell. You know, we see this guy here. I don't know if that's a B cell or a T cell, but I know it's a lymphocyte. And then we also have natural killer cells, which we'll talk about too, because they play a very nice role in the innate immune system. And I always like to say that I know this movie's getting old, because I'm getting old. But it had uh, Robert Downey Jr. in it. It had, uh, had Woody Harrelson in it. It had, um, oh, anybody know what I'm talking about? I think it was directed by uh, Oliver Stone. Does anybody remember? It was very controversial when it came out. Natural Born Killer. Y'all ever seen that? No, no, no cult movie fans here. I love that movie. Uh, I had uh, Jennifer Louise. No, not that one. Jennifer Lewis. Lewis, maybe not. Not the sign. Anyway. But when I see Natural Killer cells, I got to think about that movie because it was Natural Born Killer, and that's what these guys and girls do. I know I, know I say guys a lot, but that's what these cells do. Okay, they don't really give a hoot. Okay, if they think you're not supposed to be there, they have the ability to just kill you. Okay, and that's what they do. And we'll talk about their role a lot in this, this semester too. So that takes care of the cells and we'll move on to, this is, this is, you know, we all know that we took anatomy and phys. How much time in anatomy and phys do they spend on the lymphoid, the, the lymphatic system? Any, any at all? Yeah? Yeah? The chapter? The chapter? What, what color did they, they colored in the book? The Orange lymphatics or, or what color? Orange or yellow? Orange or yellow. Oh, my book's always green. Yeah, they always have green, right? They got the red arteries, they got the blue veins, and they got the green lymph vessels everywhere. And that's basically what they do. They basically pattern after the arcs, artery, arterioles, and then the renal and venous and all that. But they're the garbage, they're the sewage system of the body. Okay? They return all the excess fluid and all the microbial infections that are out of the circulatory system and they dump it back in there. Okay? And they dump it back in after they processed it. So your lymph nodes right, are processing the antigens. The lymph nodes have these cells, the immune cells located there. Right, so they trap some. That's why your lymph nodes swell when you get an infection or you're like, what's that knot? I got a knot in the back of my neck and it just won't go away. And the doctors, what do they do? Leave it alone. Don't touch it. It'll go away. Eventually it will. All right, that's what they tell you. They also tell us when we have like the breast cancer. Well, they had surgery and what did they used to do? They used to rip out all the lymphatics and all the lymph nodes around the area in case it was trapped in there and they didn't want it circulating, right? So all then all of a sudden you had lymphedema and you had somebody's arm swelling. And we took phlebotomy and when you took phlebotomy, you were told don't stick those arms to the women that had breast surgery on one side, right? Remember that? That's the lymphatic issue. The fluid cannot leave the, vet, the tissue because the lymphatics have been damaged, basically cut. They basically went in and cut those lymph, lymph nodes and lymph vessels out, and there's, so there's no drainage. So all of a sudden, you see somebody swelling. What happens is, is blood pressure, IVs, and venipunctures can lead to that. And that can be very, very painful. It can be very, very, like, little women don't like to see one arm twice as big as the other, and they'll start wearing a compression sleeve on this arm. And with phlebotomy, they're usually the first ones to say, no, no not do this arm, all right? And they usually let you know. And you don't, you have to do this one. And then you're like, uh, you know, I haven't been to the hospital yet. But you go to the hospital and guess what? There's an IV over here. <laughs> the, nurses, the nurses beat you to this arm and you got to figure out a way to get blood without using the right arm. Okay, so lymphatics, the garbage, system, the sewage system of the body. But the good thing about lymphoid organs, we have primary lymphoid organs, and this is where all our cells come from, and this is where you're in hematology, right? Bone marrow, 
right, is one of the largest lymphoid organs. This is where all the, what, new cells are being generated from. So heme hematopoietic stem cells are there. They develop the erythrocytes, the red blood cells, the granulocytes, the white blood cells, the monocytes, the white blood cells, platelets, right, megakaryocytes, lymphocytes, more white blood cells, all come from bone marrow. Okay, so you're right now, you're probably getting ready to start the little hierarchy of boom, boom, boom. Are you going myeloid or lymphoid? And how, who comes from those, right? From the stem cell P32, something like that. Right? <laughs> there is one of those. All right. We also have the thymus. The thymus, when we're born, it's pretty big. And then as we grow older, it gets smaller and smaller. But it's right behind your sternum. Okay, so you just pop your sternum, and there it is. It's behind there lays between there and your heart, okay? So we know that T cells come from the thymus because we give them the name T from thymus, right? Easy enough? Yeah. You're gonna get more of that, don't worry. Secondary lymphoid tissues or lymphoid organs around your body, maybe you know these, maybe you don't from physiology and anatomy, but we have spleen, okay? We got lymph nodes, we just talked about how those are. And then we have these things that are tissue laden around our bodies at different places, right? Like I said, these need to be in strategic places in your body, and they are, right? So they function as a potential site for the contact of the foreign antigen, and they increase the probability that you get an immune response. So we got mucosal associated lymph tissue around the mucosal membrane. Right? That's around your nose, any opening you got, it's got mucosal. Cutaneous associated lymph nodes, that'd be like around in your skin. So if you have something cut or scratched into your skin, we got some of those. All right, and to finish up with the spleen, we'll talk about a little bit just quickly about red pulp. Splenic tissue makes up more than one half of, your total, of the total volume red pulp does of the spleen itself and we know the role of the spleen is to get rid of our old red blood cells when they're when they've spent their how many days you don't know how many days of red blood cells i trust you huh? 120 120 yeah i trust you white pulp that's the other part of the spleen and this goes for like uh, lymph, any lymphoid organ kind of has this same look to it. The, lymph, the white pulp contains the lymphoid tissue. Okay, so you see that you get some T cells in here. Okay, so when the blood comes in to the spleen, and it's not just there, and we've got some B cells here. Okay, so we get our, our, lymph, our lymphocytes are hanging out in the spleen. Right, so that's where the blood circulates in, and that'd be a great place to process anything in the blood that's not supposed to be there. And finally, the lymph node uh, collects lymph fluid, and we get that lymph fluid back into the heart, right, at the common bile duct, not the common bile duct, but the left thoracic who was good at anatomy? Where, what is that part of the lymph? Up? When does it dump into the, the vena cava up there? What's that called? I didn't think I'd ever ask you an anatomy question, did you? That was also a long time ago. Huh? That was a long time ago. That was a long time ago? All right. Like, where does the lymph system dump into the vena cava? What's that called up there? Remember that? It, it goes up like, like there's this, like the upper lymphatic system collects down and the lower lymphatic system collects down and it opens into the vena cava, pretty close to where the vena cava branches into the heart, right? You no? Know? Isn't that like the trunk? Trunk? Yes. Okay. All right. That was my anatomy question for the day. You can look it up. All right. So we're going to move on and do another slideshow. We've got number two sitting here. And what it is, you'll see the innate immune system, lecture number two.
Oh, I already had it open down here. So this one I did a little bit, I did a little um, adjusting. I think, I don't know if you like the artwork that I found or whatever I found to do how I did this. But the innate immune system, how's Brandy, Rachel, and Kathy doing? That's one, two, and three. Yay, all right. So this is basically the chapter that you know we said we'd cover today, which is from your text. It's chapter three, all right, the innate immunity. And we're going to cover the external defenses and then we'll get into the internal. And since we introduced a lot of this already, we'll talk more about them. And so basically the innate immune system defenses against infection immediately act when a host is attacked. Yay. We need that. I think we've got that under control. Composed of two systems. We have external and we have internal. So the external, right? Anatomic barriers. We got some way to keep it out, right? We see that with mucus around our noses and see skin, right? We've got these external barriers and they play a big role too because if we lose that, it's not a good, good setup, right? We see that with burn victims. Burn victim gets burned, severely burned, loses that external protection and they're not usually, you know, not in a good spot. And they're usually in a bad spot because they become dehydrated and they come into a really bad spot when they get an infection. So burn, burn units, um, not a good spot to be in because you've lost your biggest defender to keep microorganisms out of your body. Internal defense systems, we've got cells, right? We just covered a bunch of those cells that are there to recognize uh, the pathogens, to recognize certain mm, attachments, maybe just something in their membrane. And that's what some of our tests are today for for the COVID virus is we've started recognizing some of the antigenic determinants that we can pick up on the outer coat of the virus. And so we have an antibody that detects it. So if you swab your nose, you put it on a, in a developer, you got the antibody sitting there on the test strip and then your antigen comes up here. And if it's there, it binds and it lights up. We'll show you how that works later in our testing. And then you're like, ah, oh, we see the antigen that we were looking for with that swab. Okay, we do the same thing with strep. We do the same thing with flu. Okay, those tests are designed with an antibody sitting there that will attach it as it moves over. So you guys will be doing that testing in lab and you'll definitely be doing that testing um, at the clinic when you go to work. So here's our external defenses. We see that the airways have mucus, they have cilia, right, that expel the mucus. And I know none of you smoke because you gave that up and the new generation does not believe in smoking or vaping. But when you smoke, you damage that cilia. And then you lose that ability to push that stuff out of your lungs. So when you hear smokers cough or your grandmother has a smoking cough because she smoked <laughs> 10 packs a day for 50 years and she's still alive and nothing's ever happened to her. But I bet she has a smoker's cough because she, that smoke has damaged those cilia that get that mucus up out of those lungs. She doesn't have to cough. Really, if she had the cilia, she wouldn't have to cough it up. Now we don't have the cilia, you have to cough that mucus back up. We have skin, which has uh, keratinocytes, which are the skin cells got lactic acid, we have sebaceous glands that have fatty acids, so it makes that skin a little tougher to penetrate. We have lysozymes in our salivary glands, okay, when we bring in something that we breathe in or chew in or eat in. And then if it gets to the stomach, then we have this gastric acid down here that has a very low, low pH, and it usually will take care of anything that's living that gets down to our stomach, okay? So those are kind of the basic anatomy, uh, external defense systems. Any questions on the externals? Because we want to spend most of our time on the internals. 
Okay. Urine. I don't know if you knew that, but urine helps remove potential pathogens, right? We see that. We see that because when we collect urines, we ask the patient to do a midstream collection. And if that's all you tell the patient, then guess what? The patient may not know what that means, right? So it might be up to you to be the microbiologist to come in and say, when you give that urine sample, a midstream collection means that you need to start in the pot, and then you need to put some in my cup, and then you need to go back and finish up in the pot. Because I don't need it all the way to the rim, okay? We don't need that much urine from you. But that's a midstream, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to what? trying to have them express any external stuff before you get to see what's really in the urinary tract infection, right, or the urinary tract. Now, just to track, but I'll just put a little asterisk by this. When I see that, the reason I say that is most times, if you ever go, if you've been to the doctor, right, and if they need a urine collection, what did they do? They hand you the cup and say there's the bathroom. So you may or may not do that correctly, okay? And then we know if there's a clean catch, they're supposed to give you something to clean yourself first, the external, before you do the midstream collection. Because we don't want all that, we want what's inside. We want what's coming down through the tract from the bladder, okay? We don't need to know the external bacteria. We want to see what's internal. Stomachs, hydrochloric acid gets the pH down to one. No microorganism can grow in that. And then we have normal flora, which is very key for us when you get into the, the, uh, the digestive tract. When we have normal flora, that keeps the pathogen, doesn't let the pathogen have a, a leg up, doesn't let it take hold. And you see this with our famous C. diff when our patients take antibiotics, right? Start having diarrhea in the hospital. And we're like, I bet that C diff, because what's happened is the normal flora just got wiped out with the antibiotic. And the C diff was able to take cold and start producing this toxin. Okay, so we got that story that we can talk about how normal flora is a very protective way. So maybe a couple of externals you didn't think about. So our internal defense system is the pathogen recognition receptors, okay, and this, this is, I know this is a new term, so if we go to chapter three, those that brought their book in today, you'll see that these are abbreviated, let me find it, these are abbreviated the PRRs, right, the pathogen recognition receptors. So what are those? This says they are, this is, uh, macrophages and dendritic cells, remember we talked about those. The total cellular population in the tissue, they're involved in pathogen recognition. They are able to distinguish pathogens from normally present molecules in the body by the means of the receptors known as the pathogen recognition receptor, which are also found on our neutrophils, eosinophils, monocytes, mast cells, T cells, epithelial cells, okay? So you're always wondering, how do those cells know that the pathogen? How? They have pathogen recognition receptors. So if they get close enough to it, right? They have the ability to recognize the pathogen. So all those cells we talked about earlier today have the ability to do that. All right, so that's one thing. We have acute phase reactants. Acute phase reactants, anybody know one? One that's measured when you go to the hospital or the ER and they think something's wrong with you and they go, hey, we're gonna run one of these and see if you really have it. They'll do, you know, CBC, but this is a little different. This is to see if you do have something really revved up like an acute phase reactant. Anybody know? Anybody prep through the chapter today? Read ahead and know what we're talking about, like on page 35. There's one in there. It's very famous. You probably had it run and don't even know you had it run. 
It's better than a set rate. You ever heard of set rate? Yeah, heard of that one either. How about C reactive protein? You ever heard of that one? No? Well, C reactive protein likes to show itself when your body's in stress. Okay? That's an acute phase reactant that, that elevates when your body's stressed, when your body has an infection somewhere. They're not sure where it is, but they would do that test just to make sure you don't, you're not getting infected, all right? So we get C-reactive protein done quite a bit, especially out of the ER when somebody comes in and is running a, a fever and they don't really know, like a fever of unknown origin is what they call them, and then we can run a C-reactive protein. You're actually going to measure C-reactive proteins down in the lab this semester. We just got our little kit in that's going to allow you to do that. Inflammation, of course, that's an internal defense system, and a lot of people say, well, you know, you need inflammation. You know, that's good, all right? That heats up the area, that brings in the cells, and that's just your body's response to the infection or the invasion. And then we have phagocytosis, which we talked about. Let's see that of eating. We saw that beautiful video uh, Wednesday of the big white cell chasing down the bacteria to eat it. And we're going to play with that concept in lab too. We're going to see phagocytosis. And then there's our natural killer cells sitting there and got a little highlight with them too. Well, let's look at these details. Pathogen recognition receptors, the PRRs, recognize molecules unique to the infectious organism. Macrophages, dendritic cells, neutrophils, eosinophils, monocytes, we just went through that bit. So what do they do? How did we get them, right? They're encoded by our DNA to sense extracellular infection. They recognize the pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or the PAMPs. I know we're getting a lot of PAMPs and PPs, and, but PAMPs are on the microorganism. So the PRRs, pathogen receptor recognition, right, recognize the PAMPs, which are what? The pathogen-associated molecular patterns. And then when bound to a pathogen, phagocytic cells are activated. Okay, so what, how does that happen? Encoded by the host DNA. So here's the big question. How are we living as long as we're living today and people early and early on couldn't live as long as they used to? What, what's, what's, the big, what's the big link here? What do you think? Do you think that the health of your parents and the health of your grandparents and your great-grandparents and those great-great-great-great-grandparents, all of that DNA transfer to you out here? What do you think? You think we got more PRRs than we used to? You think we can recognize more antigens now than we used to? Some really deep stuff today in immunology, and it's a great time for Friday. All right. Here's how these PRRs, this is, I love this, this is from your text. Uh, there's toll light receptors, all right? So we got PRRs and we got PAMPs, and now we got TLRs, which are toll light receptors. There's 10 types found in humans. Some are on cell surfaces and some are in your cytoplasm. But what you see is what? What do you got right here? This would be gram positive bacteria, mycobacteria, mycoplasma, and fungi are all used with what? Toll light -like receptors. This is the plasma membrane. Okay. So they have a chance to do what? Latch on to these. Okay. So here comes the phagocytic cell and it runs into a fungi or runs into mycoplasma, runs into mycobacteria, runs into a gram positive bacteria. From micro yesterday, staph aureus, yay. All right working with staph aureus yesterday, so you're 
your phagocytic cells, your neutrophils, your macrophages, all that has these receptors, these toll-like receptors to latch on to a staph bacteria. E. coli or gram-negative bacteria. Okay, and here's some mobile bacteria. So we have these one through, where were we? we're missing three. Three's down here in the internal. So I know this got cut off down here, but what do you see at top? Bow, 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 bow. Why are these on the internal part of the cell? Why not on the outside? Why not capture the virus out here instead of down here? I don't know what viruses like to do, right? You might know. Virus can't, can't live long out here. Virus has got to get in that cell. It wants to get internal. When it gets internal, the virus does what? Viruses are evil. And I, I, they had a, last year, I had an argument about that when I said that. When I said viruses are evil, I had somebody go, not all of them. Some of them are beneficial. We can work with them. We learn a lot from them. But I, I think my point was proven after this, right? We, we don't like viruses. <laughs> we, don't, we don't like what this one's done to us. We don't like what this one's put through. But viruses are intracellular, basically intracellular parasites. As they get inside the cell, and they're like, I've got to make more of me, and I'm going to do what? I'm going to use that cell I just invaded to do it. Okay. So they get in the cell, they, they, they take over the DNA of the cell, and they make the cell produce more virus parts. Right? It's like you got this like Toyota plant, right? And then Subaru wants to come in, right, and change the way Toyota is making their car. So they come in and invade the plant and put in their blueprints, and Toyota starts making Subaru. It'd be the same. That's what a virus does. A virus comes into the cell and says, "No, you can't make your parts anymore. You make my parts, and then I'm going to put myself together, and I'm going to butt out of that cell and go invade another one." That's viral replication, and we're going to get into that this semester in micro. So that's the toll-like receptors. Hopefully, you get a picture of what's going on with the PRRs the PAMPs and the TLRs. So they're glycoproteins. They bind to particular substances. They're activated by cytokines and chemokines. So all that communication we talked about earlier with the cells that's going on and they can destroy most pathogens that humans are exposed to before disease sets in. And we are very appreciative of that every day, right? Because that's the whole idea. We don't, we want to get taken care of before that happens. So there's a difference between infected and being sick, okay? So we've seen a lot of people be infected right now but aren't getting sick. And so if we, we're trying to figure out a way. Right now we can't stop the infection, but maybe we can slow down the sick or prevent the sick. That comes later. We have some others. C-type lectin receptor, I, you know, um, retinoic acid inducible gene, uh, one light receptors. These are I'm not. No, these are others. I'm. I'm not really. I think. I think we're good if we get the first part down. I'm not worried about that slide as much as the other stuff. I think the. PRRs, PAMPs, and the TLRs is where I want you to remember. Okay. Acute phase reactants, we talked about these as that C reactive protein we introduced earlier. They're soluble factors found in our blood. Okay. They increase rapidly when we get infection or injury or tissue trauma. And it, it's not just always infection that revs up our immune system. Okay, I always tell the story of the very first diff, one of the first diffs I did, was on a car wreck victim. And I was like, oh my gosh, because I was, you know, if you haven't gotten here yet with hematology, but you're going to get to bands, which are immature neutrophils. And this smear had bands galore. I was just counting band after band after band. I was like, oh my gosh, they are infected. And I took that to the doctor and I'm like, oh, I've got something to show the doctor. So I'm coming down to the ER and I'm like, 
look here, Doc. Look at that. Look at that band count I got. Look at that. He just kind of looked at me like I knew him forever. He like looked at me for two seconds to go. They were in a car wreck. Stress. And he just moved on. It's like, it makes sense, right? <laughs> Stress. Stress can make these things increase too. So tissue injury, trauma. That can increase your white cells. Your body goes, oh my gosh, you just went through a car wreck. Something's wrong. Here's all these immature neutrophils. Maybe you need those. Whew. And your body releases them. And then they're in your peripheral smear. And you see that. So keep that in mind. Don't go running down to the dock and go, hey, what about that? This person's almost going to die from an infection. No, they're just in a car wreck, son. Anyway, old doc, young tech, lesson learned. Facilitate contact between microbes and phagocytic cytokines. Those are these cytokines help, right? Get the phagocytic cell into the area of where the infection is. Mop up, I love that. Mop up and recycle imported proteins after phagocytosis because phagocytosis isn't messy, right? Cell destroying. Sometimes they destroy their cells to do that, and we have a problem. So there is a cleanup. So here are our acute phase reactants from our, our text. C reactive protein sitting here at the top. We get a four to six hour response. Their normal concentration is 0.5 milligrams per deciliter. So if you're having trouble with those units, I'll help you out a little bit. And then they can increase a thousand times. So we go from 0.5, what's a thousand times 0.5? Somebody's good man. I'm trying to find my dilution people. I'm going to rely on in a couple of weeks. 500. 500. I like it. Yeah. Optimization. What is that? You might have heard that term before. Optimization. That increases what? The immune response. That increases the chance of getting it eaten. So whatever happens, like we said, these, these acute phase reactants bring in the the microbe and the phagocytic cell, they increase the chances of that phagocytic cell getting to eat, right? Complement activity, love complement, okay? Complement's coming, kind of like uh, your Game of Thrones fan. We'll just keep saying complement's coming, okay? Because complement cascade is so fun to learn. It's just, right, you know, I, I'm just going to make a wager. I don't think anybody has learned the complement cascade yet. Is that right? Got the math. Inside the math. Got the... So nobody knows the complement cascade? Okay, great. Great. We're going to learn it. And okay, we have some others. We got sera, serum, amyloid A. Mm, we, I don't know if we ever measured that in the lab at all. Alpha one anatrypsin. Yeah, that's getting it's getting closer. We may have a specialist that wants that one. Fibrinogen, sure. That, that's we need that sometimes. Heptoglobulin, no. Zero serum plasma. The complement three down here. So yes, we would love that. And what you see is what they do. This is their their role. But we'll stick with the big ones right now until we get need to get a little deeper. How are we doing on time? A few more minutes. What is it, alpha anatrypsin? Oops, go back. Alpha 1 anatrypsin, protease inhibitor. Is it like, is it hard? You know, I think it is. I think it is an indicator. Of, I remember seeing it. But I want to say I'm thinking more protein A. Lipo A is more of an indicator for heart, so, but you think alpha anatrypsin is? Well, let's see. We got time. Let's see. You find it in your textbook? I mean, I could be wrong. No, here it is. It's got a big, it's got a big section. If you read ahead, did you read ahead? Is that why you're asking me? I just remember it from chemistry last night. Do you remember it from chemistry? Uh, who's read ahead? It was on page 36, 37. What do we got for AAT? We do get complement activity from it, like that. Uh, 
Pastor well, be proud or disappointed? You, nobody has their book. Is that what I'm gathering here? Is that what I'm feeling? Feeling we're not, we don't have our book to, to refer to. It, it definitely has the mop up role of mopping up after phagocytosis. Okay. Protein is primarily synthesized in the liver. It's a major component of the alpha band, serum electrophoresis. We'll see that a lot later. The name implies that it acts against trypsin, and the general plasma inhibitor. It's released from the leukocytes. We like that. A last taste, one of the proteinases, is the enzyme secreted by neutrophils during inflammation and can be degraded. The elastin and collagen, which means it tears up the tissue. Okay. So when the neutrophils do their business, this is what we say about messy, like at the wound, it's really messy and gets the pus, right? But you're, if, if you ever had an infection and you're going, what's happening to my skin, right? It's melting away. What happens is, is these things are being released by the, the white cells for destruction purposes. Those granules don't, they do more than just kill the bacteria. They're, they're destroying your tissue too. So that's the big thing about wound care. If you got an infection, you got to take care of it or the, me the melting of the tissue is going to happen. I don't know if y'all have ever had an infection that bad, but it takes a it's like, oh my gosh, it's getting bigger and that skin's going away. And, you know, but that's kind of an alpha one antitrypsin is released during that time. So we see it there. So it's not specific for any part, or did you say liver? Well, proteinase is tearing up your tissue. That's an enzyme tearing up protein. So ana, alpha anatrypsin is there to clean up the neutrophils damage. That's the mop up. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, we are almost out of time. We don't want to give and we got a little ways to go, so we'll come back at process of inflammation. Okay. I don't want to go over. To get us in the habit of going over. So I'm gonna stop my share at process inflammation. And then we're gonna say adios. Kathy, Brandy, and Rachel. And we'll see y'all again on Monday, same place, same time. Remember, we need to exit better than we did um, yesterday at Micro. So we need to exit the front row, go out the door. We need to wipe down the desk as we do it. I'm going to go ahead and stop this so I can start getting the Zoom downloaded.